Hello and welcome to this section. In this section, we will learn the execution of event. In this section, we mainly include the following four knowledge points, the hierarchical relationship of event, the conditional execution of event, the circular execution of event, and the synchronization and asynchrony of event. First of all, we will learn the hierarchical relationship of event. First of all, let's open the editor, let's open a small number guessing game that we finished in the classroom in the last lesson, let's top in, let's select an event like number guessing. Through this event, we review the hierarchical relationship of event. In the last lesson, we have simply mentioned that the so-called hierarchical relationship of event is that each event may have its parent or its conditions. For example, what are the three conditions attached to? They are all attached to the click event. So when we put all the three conditions away, we can see that it points to the click event from all the three leads. Next, we click the first condition. We can see that the result assignment and the display of such a refresh button below are all attached to such a condition. We can also see such two events, both of which are led by such a purple lead and attached to such an enterprise condition. So when we are making an event, we first need to determine a hierarchical relationship, so when we add an event, we first need to determine whether our hierarchical relationship is added correctly. Generally speaking, we can make a judgment through such a lead. Next, we enter into the condition implementation of key events in this chapter. In the last lesson, we have learned how to add a condition, and we have learned one of the simplest conditions, which is our enterprise condition, and it is actually equal to if. We can review the previous application, and we can see that there are three enterprise conditions, and what is the meaning of the condition, and it is actually the meaning of our if. That is, if such a value is satisfied, it will execute the following event. So we can see a very obvious logic here, that is, if its random number is equal to the random number we entered, when this condition is met, I will let him copy the result, and let him refresh the button. If a random number is greater than a value we enter, we will assign a value to the result equal to your guess. And if one of its random numbers is smaller than one of its input contents, we will assign a value to the result and say that you guessed big, but please note that here we use three parallel conditions and each interval is enumerated by ourselves. For example, you can see that the first interval is equal to, the second interval is greater than, and the third interval is less than. In our logic, we have asked him to complete all one interval. Then we learn the second condition. The second condition is our other conditions. The other conditions are actually equal to the else if condition in our usual programming. Note that because this is an ls, you know when ls must be used. It must be used after if. Therefore, we can only use the rest under enterprise conditions. So how to use such other conditions? Here is a simple explanation for you. In the same way, we still come to such a application. We first modify such a application. That is, if he guesses right, we let him say that he guesses right. If he doesn't guess right, we will tell him that you guessed wrong. Then how can we modify such a logic? As far as our usual logic is concerned, we can write it this way, that is, what about the value of random numbers? It doesn't mean you entered a content. Tell him you guessed wrong here, right? Then we can have a simple preview here, and look, er, we should not guess right when we come. So, we choose a 50-point number to guess, and you can tell you that you guessed wrong when you look at it. Why? Because these two sides are actually two mutually exclusive conditions, that is, they are either equal to or unequal, and here we can use our other conditions to replace the following mutually exclusive conditions. That is, if this condition is not satisfied, then we will execute the following condition. How to change it? Here, we can change it into one of the other conditions, and we can erase the conditions here together. There is no need to add anything below the rest. The rest means that it follows such a condition, and its conditions are not satisfied, then it will immediately the following will be executed. Let's take a look here, that is, we delete its conditions and change the following conditions into a rest. Let's take a look at the preview again. For example, if you enter a 50 here and click a guess number, you can see that it is still correctly reflected, that is, you guessed wrong. 
Therefore, ah, here we have a new knowledge point. The so-called and the rest is that if the other enterprises in front of it do not meet such other conditions, it will be implemented immediately. So, ah, here we need to remember such a knowledge point, one and immediately followed by other such operations. That is to say, if the conditions of the enterprise in front of the rest are not satisfied, then the action in the rest will be executed. However, some students will say that the conditions of your restriction are too harsh, that is, generally speaking, how can there be only one and, and then the following is a mutually exclusive condition. In such a case, what should I do if I want the third condition to be displayed? In fact, this is our very classic enterprise. Here, we copy such a value. In fact, we can accumulate it. What do the other conditions of such an enterprise mean? These three conditions are completely mutually exclusive, that is, if the conditions of the first enterprise are met, he will not implement the other two. If the condition of the second word is satisfied, he will not execute the condition of the third word. If none of the above conditions is satisfied, then the last one without any conditions will be implemented. Let's take a look at the effect. Here we enter a 50. He told me that you guess it's small. Then here, let's take a 75, or guess it's small. Here, let's take a 85, or guess it's small. Let's take a 95, or guess it's small, and here, let's take a 99. Guess big 97. Yes, you guessed right, so one condition here is that the other conditions complete a practice that is completely equal to our previous condition. However, there are two differences between the other conditions of such an enterprise and the conditions of an enterprise just like us. The first point is the just cut and cut approach. It seems that he did not perform the next two steps, but in fact, each of its conditions is judged. It is only because the latter two conditions are due to us what he writes by himself is a completely mutually exclusive condition, so he doesn't execute such a content. For such a content and the rest, if any of his conditions have been met, he won't carry out another execution. Secondly, there is another difference, that is, for an enterprise model like ours, ah, we don't need to write any conditions for the last one. He means that no matter how many conditions he has in front of him, as long as he follows such one and all the other conditions are not met, he will naturally implement the other effect of his last one without any conditions. So, ah, let's remember that the so-called and other models are in the previous and other models. If any one of them is satisfied, the rest will not be executed. If none of the preceding and the rest of the preceding are satisfied, then the last one without any conditions will be executed. Then there will be a common misunderstanding here. I also explained it directly here. First, I will drag such an enterprise condition to the end. I will change the first condition into an enterprise, I will change the second condition into a money, then change the third condition into a rest, and then input the second condition into it, for example, for the second condition, if the value of random number is less than the value of such a content as we please guess, we will directly tell him that your guess is big here, and then we won't need the condition for the last one. Let's read such a logic. I won't help you interpret it first. Now let's think about it in our hearts, that is, oh, if such a random number is greater than a content we'd like to guess, oh, that proves that my input is relatively small, so you're small when you input it here. Then, if the value I randomly input is less than one of its input contents, it will tell me that you guessed big. If you are not satisfied, I will tell him that you guessed right, and then let him display it. Then when we initialize, we also print out such a generated random number, which is convenient for us to understand, and then we have a preview. Similarly, reselling is to open the check. Because I just printed it during initialization, we can see that the value of a random number here is 22, so let's enter a 50 here and click a guess number. It will tell us that your guess is big, right? Then we pretend that we don't know that his answer is 22. We enter a 10 and click a guessing number. We can find that when I enter 10, he directly tells me that you guessed right, but we randomly say that it is clearly 22. Why does he directly show you that you guessed right? We must have a deep understanding of this. This is also a mistake we often use when meeting other conditions. It's the rest of us. What's the actual content it performs? 
it follows the above one, and if it is not executed, the rest of it will be executed. Let's go back here. Our correct random number is 22. Let's bring in a value like 22, and then we enter a 12. Is 12 greater than 10? It's larger than, so it's assigned as small as you guess. So after executing such an event, he first assigned the value of guess small to you, which has been displayed, and then he executed the following enterprise. I just told you, because the conditions of such two enterprises will be judged at the same time, and it will not bypass such an event, so he went to the next step, that is, his random number is 22, and he asked whether 22 is less than the number you guessed. What do we guess? Guess 12. 12 is obviously not less than 10, right? Therefore, such a value will not be displayed. However, due to such an enterprise condition, it will be followed by another one, so it will be executed. Because it will be executed here, do we copy it in an instant for you to guess, but at this moment, because it is not executed, it will be followed by such a one without a strip he must carry out the rest. Therefore, even if it is copied as your guess is small, and due to such an enterprise condition, it is repeatedly copied as your guess is correct, so this is a point that we must pay attention to. If I change the conditions here to the rest, there will be no problem. Why? Because of the structure of adventure, no matter how many adventures you have, any enterprise or adventure in front will not continue to implement, so let's take a look at the effect here. ER, you see, the default value is 26. Here, we enter a 50 and click a guessing number. You see, your guess is big, and then we deliberately guess a very small point, a 10. You see, he says you guess it is small, and then we enter a 26 point demolition for A. You see, here, you guessed it right, so pay attention, ah, and the rest is not the same thing at all son, it is completely independent of the two contents. Okay, next, let's study or condition or condition, that is, if we meet one of the two, we can complete such a condition or condition. What about this? Let's pull out another input box here. Let's make a copy of this one, but change its feature. Let's ask him to ask for the contents of books 1 100. This way, it's not called guessing numbers. This way, it's called satisfaction. Then this way, it's called a result to satisfy the result. Then let's do such a thing here, that is, when I click whether such a value is satisfied, judge the content in it, and then use such a text box to tell us whether it meets such a result. First, let's do such a condition, that is, whether such a value we enter can be 2 or 3 how do we write this? Let's change it. Here, we don't want to add a condition. Under the condition, we will add an event. What should we write under this condition? That is, if we input such a new content, ah, what is its content division? Is it after the percentage? If it can be divided by 2, it is the case that the remainder is equal to 0. What is the value of such a satisfying result? Is equal to a satisfaction. Then, let's add another condition directly here. Ha, if it is not satisfied, it will be copied as an unsatisfied one. In fact, it can be written directly here without adding any conditions. As long as the previous one does not meet the latter one, the rest will be executed naturally. What am I judging now? It is such a content entered in the input box. Is it an even number, right? Let's take a look at an effect in preview preview. For example, do we have a 50 here to satisfy A? Then we change it to a 51, whether it is satisfied or not. You see, he says he is not satisfied, so at present, if we say that he can be divided by 2, we will do well. Then on this basis, we now add a condition that it can be divided by 3 in addition to being divided by 2. What should we do? We click the plus sign here to add a judgment condition. Shallow means that both must be satisfied at the same time, so we can copy and paste one here. That is, if it is two integers divided by equals zero, and three integers divided by equals zero, then it can be satisfied. Otherwise, it will not be satisfied, right? Then here we will preview again, and then we will write a four first, whether the top level is satisfied. If he says that he is not satisfied, let's change a 5. If he is satisfied, d 
Do you think that he is not satisfied? If we change a six, then he will be satisfied. Why? Because you see six divided by two rounded to zero, right? Then the rounding of six divided by three is also zero, so and in means that the two must meet such a condition at the same time, so that he can execute the following event, and then we change it into a puzzle. What does dispelling doubts mean? That is, any one of these two conditions can be met. Here we have a preview to see the effect. First, let's enter a 1. If you look at 1, it can't be divided by 3 or 2, so it's not satisfied, right? Then I enter a second. Is it satisfied? You see, because 2 can be divided by 2, it is satisfied. Similarly, we enter a 3, and 3 can be divided by 3, so it is also satisfied. We enter a 4 or 4, which can be divided by 2, and it is also satisfied. Then we enter a 5, which cannot be divided by 2, and cannot be divided by 3, so it is not satisfied. So what does such a puzzle mean? It is one of the two to satisfy either of them, so we must remember that a and or means that either of them can be satisfied. So now we add a condition that the number we enter should be divisible by 5 and divisible by 2 or 3. In this case, how should we write it? Let's start with such a literal translation. Let's write such a condition. Let's see if it's right. Can be divided by 5, right? The first condition is that it divided by a 5 must be equal to 0, so that it can be divided by 5, and then it can be divided by 2, right? So let's add 1 here and divide it by 1 and 2 will be equal to 0, right? And then he said, if you divide a by 2 or 3, I know, right? I change a condition to 1 or, and then copy and paste this. It is divided by 3 equals a 0. Let's take a look here, that is, it can be divided by 5, and it can be divided by 2, or it can be divided by 3. Let's take a look. If we directly carry out a preview, what kind of effect is it? Here, we directly enter a 5 to see if it is satisfied. We click 5 to see if it is satisfied. You see, he says it is not satisfied. Why not? If he can be divided by 5, he can be divided by 5. His division is equal to 1, right, but he can't be multiplied and divided by 2 or 3, so he's not satisfied here. Then why can he tell me that he is satisfied? In fact, this is because the condition we wrote here is in goods. What does it mean? Let's first think about what goods mean. The meaning of goods is that as far as the enterprise in front of it is concerned, it is okay to meet either of them. For such a and condition, are they equivalent, so they must be met at the same time, so who is the owner of this goods? It can satisfy such a condition either when it is divided by 5 and 2 at the same time, or when it can be divided by 3. So in fact, what is the result of our translation here? That is, it is a multiple of 10, or it is a multiple of 3. So let's preview the effect here. Let's first input a multiple of non-real or non-3, for example, 8, which is not satisfied. Then we input another 5, which is not satisfied. Let's input a multiple of 10, which is satisfied. Let's see that the multiple of 10 is satisfied, if you enter a multiple of 3 randomly, you can see that it is also satisfied. Therefore, an enterprise here is a merger condition, that is, it must be divisible by 5, and you must be divisible by 2. Then the goods are shipped together with this, which is equivalent to that as long as the first two are short of money, and they are not satisfied, they can meet such a goods condition, so the last condition we write is not divisible by 5 and divisible by 2 or 3. Finally, what is the logic we wrote here? It's a logic that can be divided by 10 or 3. If we really want to write, our current logic is that we can be divided by 5, and can be divided by 2 or 3. How do we do this? We can change the conditions here a little. How do we write? We add a condition here. We put such a condition and the condition is copied, then pasted, and then changed to a 0, which is satisfied. We used such a structure to complete a production. Let's see the effect. First of all, let's see if it's really right. Is equal to 12 satisfied or not, and then equal to 15 satisfied? 
satisfied, then equal to a 20, satisfied? Satisfaction is equal to a 10. Is it satisfied? Satisfaction is equal to a 12. Is it satisfied? Not satisfied, then equal to an 18 is satisfied? Not satisfied. Then let's enter a value equal to 30. Is it satisfied? Also satisfied. It is now that a structure like ours has achieved the condition that it can be divided by 5 and 1 by 2 or 3. So how should we write such a condition? In fact, we have also summed up a rule here, that is, such a structure, which is also a structure we often use, which must be satisfied. We put it in the second enterprise, and then arbitrarily meet one. We put it in the first and the first goods. How to understand this? We give this sentence to facilitate everyone to understand that the actual meaning of this sentence is that it can be adjusted by 5. What can be adjusted by 5? Is its premise, right? So we have to put it in the second cut. If you look at the cut followed by it, it is a condition that must be met. In fact, it doesn't matter how you write the first two. You see that it can be divided by two or three. Therefore, it's okay for you to write here as three or here as three, that is, you can meet either of them you have to write in or conditions, and then they have to meet the requirements. You have to write in the enterprise conditions, so it is very easy for us to confuse such a structure and obtain it, and we may have a little bit of structure to master. I also regard it as a special function, so we can have a memory. Here, you can change this order, divide here by 5, and then divide here by a 2. If you change this order a little, you will better understand it, that is, the so-called condition we must meet. You see, we must meet. We all put it in the second cut. You see the second cut here, and the second cut here, and then any satisfaction is that you can see that it can be divided by two or three, so you put it in the first condition, and the condition followed by the goods. So you see, 13 it is that you meet one arbitrarily, and then the second you change it into one or condition, and then what must be met will follow such an enterprise condition. This is a and or structure. Then this is the whole content of our conditional execution. Then we go down to a loop of our event, and loop we mainly include two types of loops, namely our number of loops and conditional loops. Let's first learn such a number cycle. The number cycle is how many times you tell it to cycle, you can see how many times it will cycle. One thing to note here is that the number of cycles starts from zero. Let's make a number cycle here. There's a guessing number here. Come on, let's make another be here. Let's pull a button and put it under our parameter word. Here's a result called cheating. What does cheating mean? Just let the system automatically guess for us dot but here, ah, I want to tell you, in fact, there is a little problem with what we write now. Why? This is the sentence written in tips, that is, our cycle times start from zero, so when we enter the first cycle, its cycle times are zero. So when we enter the 100th cycle, what are its cycle times? It's 99, right? So if the random number we generated is exactly equal to 100 under this condition, can't we do B? So for our current number cycle, we need to write the number of times equal to 101. Therefore, the number cycle is particularly easy to understand, that is, you tell him how many times you want to do on your side, and the content in it how many times does he do it for you. Here we play a little bit bigger. Here we use the debugging system, and we print out the number of cycles. We print out the number of cycles. Here we add a dividing line, which is the number of cycles. Then we click a preview to have a look, and get ready at present, there is nothing in the side console. We click a cheating pop 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 pop. Pop 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 how many times does it cycle between? It circulates 101 times, 
so it's very easy to understand such a number of cycles. That is, how many times do you want the event to be executed? You can input the corresponding times here. Then, in addition to our number of cycles, there is also our conditional cycle. The definition of conditional cycle is in a sentence, that is, as long as it meets this condition, it will always be executed. Then we directly modify it under such a condition. We change such a number cycle into such a conditional cycle. You can see under the conditional loop, it comes with a condition, that is, if it wants to meet any condition, it will always execute such a content. For us, what do we want it to do? Is it a value? As long as it is not equal to the random number on us, it will always execute. It is the same that we add a numerical variable in front end first, which is called our cheating value here. Then, when we click cheating, let's judge here, that is, if the value of such a cheating value newly generated here is not equal to the value of a random number, let it continue to execute. But here we are going to add an action. Under such a condition, we still need to let our cheating value go into a cycle every time to perform a plus one operation. So we also change the conditions here, that is, if we say that a value of such a cheating number is equal to a random number, then we will assign a value to such a text. What is the value of such a cheating number? Assignment is equal to a value of such a cheating number. In the same way, we also print out such a cheating value above. Let's interpret such a world panel. When it is clicked, if one cheating value is not equal to our random number, it is unequal to such a condition, it will always execute such an event below. What will it do? It will first judge whether our cheating value is equal to our random number. If it is equal, assign a value to our input box equal to its cheating value, then add one to the cheating value, and then he will go to the outer layer. Then, because our cheating value is already equal to our random number, so if he doesn't meet such a condition, he won't continue to do it. Then, if he doesn't wait here, he is only allowed to add a random number that cheating value can't be used. Therefore, he will execute one of the contents in it. Let's preview the effect. When we click such a cheating button, we can see that the random number is 2, and then after cycling one or two times, you find a very strange thing. No, it's this input box. It doesn't help us input a content. What does that mean? This shows that we have such a content. In fact, he has not executed it at all. When his 2 is equal to such a random number, will he no longer do such a cycle? Therefore, if the cheating value is equal to the value of such a random number, he will not perform it again, so he will not copy such a step. In order to avoid such a content, we change such an event to make a judgment after our accumulation. ER, since the random number generated here is a range of 1 100, there is no problem if the default cheating value is 0 because the generated random number 0 must be added with 1, so it will make a judgment from 1. OK, let's preview it to see an effect. Here, let's click to make bot equal to 83. You see, now we are ordering at the beginning, it will directly say that you guessed right. Therefore, regardless of the number of conditional cycles, it depends on your actual situation. But it is worth noting that he will only go in if this condition is true. If this condition is false, he will never go in again. Then we will learn about the synchronization and asynchronism of event, which is also a difficulty and key point. I hope you will pay enough attention to it. First of all, let's take a look at the definition of synchronization and asynchronism. Synchronization is to wait for the last action to be executed before the next action is executed. And the so-called step is the next action of the next step. It will not wait for the next event to be executed. It will skip an action and directly carry out an execution. How can we understand the meaning of waiting for the last action to be executed before the next action is executed? Here I add another one here, for example, I do a bad one here, I add a system interface here, and then go to display a pop-up window, and this side is called a middle section, and then here I preview to see an effect, you see, when I click a button now, you see that 111 has come out, but this side shows an interrupt, and then when I click when you are sure, you can see 2233 before it continues to come out, so you can see ah is the so-called synchronous event, 
it has to wait for the last action. After that, it can carry out the next action. In fact, all such a series of event that we have just done in the event are synchronous event, so it will be executed from top to bottom, and it will wait for the completion of the last execution before executing the next action. That's why when we did the results here before, didn't we see the results covered? That's one reason. So now we understand the synchronous event. The so-called synchronous event is to wait for the last action to be executed before the next action is executed. What is our asynchronous event? Since we haven't learned an asynchronous operation yet, here I will make a very simple asynchronous event. Our service is a very simple asynchronous event. Here I will simply tell you that when I call this service, a value equal to 123 will be used. This is a very simple one asynchronous event, S. In the same way, we still use such a button to call it. In the same way, we add an event here, which is to call one of our services, and call the service. Then, when this is finished, he needs to let us accept a result. So we take a numerical variable here to accept such a result. When it is finished, we will perform an assignment operation on such a numerical variable, which is equal to the return of our return result, which is the value defined here. Then, in the following application system, we will change the debugging information into the value of such a numerical variable. Let's take a look at the general value in the preview effect. When I click, for the first time, there is an interrupted effect in front, so it is executed from top to bottom. When it is executed to such a pop-up window, it will be interrupted, right? Then when I click OK, he calls such a service, but we notice how many numerical variables are printed by the application system here? AIS is zero, right? Then he prints a 33, in other words, what is the value of such a numerical variable? It's zero, but we have a negative value for it, and a negative return value. What's the return value? The return value is 123, but why is the value printed here still a zero? This is actually a concept of our asynchronism, that is, the next asynchronous action. It will not wait for the completion of the asynchronous event. It will directly skip the asynchronous action and directly execute it. What does that mean? So in fact, when we perform such an asynchronous operation, it does not wait for our assignment, but directly prints a debugging record, which is equivalent to such an event. He doesn't care about him at all, so he directly prints a numerical variable. What is the numerical variable before there is no negative value? is zero. Therefore, for him, he has directly completed the printing of such a debugging record, so this is the default. Then the question comes again, that is, what if we want such an operation to be executed after asynchrony? Oh, so we need to put one of its actions in our callback. How can we understand this? We drag such a debugging record out to our completion. We can also see who is following its lead. Let's follow a service like ours. Next, let's have a preview to see the effect. Next, when I click such a button, you can see, ah, first 111, and then how the interrupt comes from, that is, first debug the record, and then when it is interrupted, then he calls such a service. Let's click OK. You can see that 333 appears first. Why 333 appears first? We can see what this service is. It's an asynchronous operation so he doesn't wait for him, so he completely ignores the time when it is executed, so he goes directly to the back, so the debugging record 333 is printed directly, we can see that 33 is printed, and then when the next service is completed, he finishes copying such a variable, and then application the system prints out the value of such a numerical variable, so a 123 paper is displayed here. Therefore, we must pay attention to two points here. The first point is why we need an asynchronous operation. In fact, it is very simple. Let's understand when we go to the server to get the data back, right there is not a big difference in the performance of the server according to the bandwidth of the server. It may take a moment to get it back. It may take a few seconds. Therefore, in this case, the machine does not know to reserve a reaction time of a few seconds. Therefore, we have such an asynchronous operation, that is, if it is finished, it is doing the following series of operations due, so the so-called completion, 
ah means that when he has finished this thing, he will perform the following series of operations. So what is it like to encounter all asynchronous events? It is unequal. So in the end, our demonstration effect is like this, that is, when we click, we first print one by one, and then interrupt it. When we click OK, 333 prints at first, and then such an asynchronous operation. When he finishes, he gets such a data, then copies such a numerical variable, and then we change the value the value of the quantity is printed, so we should pay enough attention to such synchronous and asynchronous execution. In the following courses, we will also deepen your understanding of synchronous and asynchronous operations. That's all the content of this section. Thank you for watching.